Well, we're in a series right now just called Jesus Said Blessed. It is taken from the Beatitudes in Matthew chapter 5, the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. And as we read through these Beatitudes, these are kingdom principles. They are principles that we as the children of the kingdom of God should be living in in our lives. In Matthew chapter 5 and verse 6, Jesus said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Being hungry and thirsty, that's not normally considered to be a good thing. No, we don't like to be hungry and thirsty, do we? But when it comes to this, Jesus says we're blessed if we are hungry and thirsty for righteousness. And we need to understand a little bit about what Jesus is talking about when he says righteousness. Righteousness is what we have, well, when we're righteous. And to be righteous is to be right with God. It is being close to God. And we should be hungry for more of Him. We should always desire to be closer to Him. We ought to be thirsty for God Himself. But to be righteous is also being totally free from sin, from past sins, free from the guilt, the condemnation, but also it is being free from sin in our life. To be righteous makes us, well, where we can walk right into the throne room and come to our Father for grace in our time of need. To be righteous, it frees us from anything that would have a hold on us. But I want you to hear this now. I think sometimes people have gotten pretty far afield uh, in their understanding of what righteousness is. But a, a definition for that word righteousness, it refers to the conduct of a man who follows the will of God and pleases Him. Here in Matthew 5, 6, I want you to notice that Jesus doesn't say the righteous are blessed. There's a whole lot of Scripture that talks about how that the righteous are blessed. There's so many promises throughout the Scripture, especially in the book of Psalms, where it, it just declares that this is a promise for the righteous. And so we need to know this. Yes, the righteous are blessed with so many things. But what Jesus is talking about here specifically, He says it's that hunger and thirst for righteousness. Oh, do you hunger for it? Do you thirst for it? See, some people say, oh, I've already got that. This, Jesus isn't talking about that. He's talking about hungering and thirsting, that you desire this, that you are seeking this, that you want the, that righteousness in your life. You know, most of us, uh, you talk about hunger and thirst, most of us have never really had to go hungry, maybe except between meals, right? Or when you're on a diet, you know, can't eat this, can't eat that. You're, maybe you're on, on, even on a fast. And see, I, I got to tell you, um, on some level, I'm hungry all the time, except when I preach. I'm not hungry while I'm preaching. I hope you're not hungry while I'm preaching, but if you are, it's too bad. But I'm not hungry while I preach. It's the one time that I'm not hungry. Now, you know, I always think I'm hungry, and so if, you know, Carmen's not looking, I go to the refrigerator, and I'm, I'm hungry, so I'm looking in the refrigerator, and I see, oh man, there's cloths and pickles. I just love that, but mm, if I eat one of those, Carmen won't kiss me, and so, oh, there's some cheese. That looks good, but mm, I don't know. That's not really what I want either, and there's some green beans. I don't know. I don't want that. I closed the refrigerator door. I wasn't really hungry. Really hungry? You know when you're really hungry? That's when you've been on that diet or a fast, and now you get to have some carrots. Yum. Oh, they're so good. Some of you are thinking, no way. Oh, you've never been hungry. Now, I want to tell you, if you're hungry enough, it is really good. But I just want to make the point to you here that we're not talking about some casual desire. We're talking about a desperate desire that we really want this, that we are seeking this hunger and thirst for His righteousness. Amen. It is to be right with Him, but it is also that we 
hunger and thirst to do right. See, we can't do either without the grace of our Lord Jesus working in us. We're going to go to Romans chapter 3 and begin with verse 19. And I'm just going to tell you that any time that we need to tear down strongholds and you know, really change the way that we think about something, the Word of God is the way to do that. Because, listen, it's not about the opinion of man. It's what the Scripture says. It's what God says. That's what really matters. And that's the truth that sets free. Beginning from verse 19, he says, Now we we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. All the world is guilty before God. And the, the law came to show us what was right and what was wrong. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. And again, it shows us what is right. We have the knowledge of sin because we have the law. And it says that no flesh, no body will ever be justified by keeping the law. You know why? Because we all fail. Some people think, oh no, in the Old Testament, you know, they were justified by keeping the law. No, they weren't. Nobody ever has been justified by keeping the law. Verse 21, but now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe. For there is no difference, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth as the propitiation, that just means the payment for your sin, by His blood through faith to demonstrate His righteousness, because in His forbearance God has passed over the sins that were previously committed, to demonstrate at the present time His righteousness, that He might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Now, again, the Scripture says it very plainly that nobody is righteous by the works of the law. It can't be done. We've all already blown it. We've all sinned. Nobody can be righteous by the works of the law. And we know that it is by faith. It is by faith in what Jesus has done for us. Nobody's going to get into heaven because they were a good person. Nobody's going to go to heaven because they did more good than bad. There's only one way you can get into heaven. It is by faith in the sacrifice of the Lamb of God and what He did for us. That's the only way. And we we need to know that, and and we're never going to change that, that it is by faith in what He has done. And the enemy of your soul, he'll always try to accuse you, he'll try to convince you that, that you're not righteous, and he'll try to get you under guilt and condemnation and beat you down, tell you that you don't deserve the blessings of God. Well, you don't deserve them. But he'll try to tell you that God's not going to bless you. He'll try to convince you that maybe even that you're not really a Christian. But I want you to know something. Jesus, the Lamb of God, has paid the price for your sin so that you could be right with God. That accuser of the brethren, always trying to bring that old guilt. You know, we've all felt that at times, that, that weight of condemnation. The Bible says in Romans 8, there's therefore now no condemnation unto them who are in Christ Jesus. Thank God. See, to have that right standing with God, to be right in our relationship with Him. But also, we are supposed to do right. Just remember, it is by faith in what He has done that we're made righteous. But we need to understand this, that we, as we are righteous by faith, you see, a lot of people have taken that to mean that it doesn't matter how we live. The Bible doesn't say that. 
You see, they say, well, you know, nobody's righteous by the works of the law, so it doesn't matter how I live. Does it matter what sin I commit? And this is such an issue in the church today. There are churches that not only accept but embrace horrible sins and accept certain lifestyles. You hear what I'm saying? But at what level, you see, have we accepted things in our life that we know really aren't right, that aren't really the way it should be, but we just kind of wash over it by saying, oh, but you know, I'm forgiven. It doesn't matter. It does matter. I want you to understand this morning, when we hunger and thirst for righteousness, yes, we want that closeness with Jesus. And this is part of the issue, you see, is that it, when we become complacent and we're no longer passionate about Him and going after Him, we have lost our hunger and our thirst for righteousness. When we no longer want to be like Him, we no longer want to get the, the sins out of our life, the compromise out of our life, we've lost our hunger and our thirst for righteousness. It's how so much of the time the church ends up looking way too much like the world because we have just taken this idea that since we are righteous by faith, it doesn't matter how I live. And I want, you, I want you to hear me that that is not at all what the Scripture teaches. You're going to see that this morning. But rather, you see, there is to be this sanctification that takes place in our life day by day. Let me tell you, salvation is not just an event. It is a process. Sanctification is not just an event. It is a process. Yes, God is making us His holy people, but it is not something that He just sticks a, a different label on you and calls you holy. No, He's making us His holy people. That's what He wants to do. Listen, Matthew 6.33 says, Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Seeking the kingdom, that's simply seeking His reign and rule in our life. It is seeking His will. And then He says, and righteousness. Seeking first, seek first the kingdom and His righteousness. We want to please God. We want to live the way He wants us to live. And when we seek first the kingdom, He adds everything else. He takes care of everything else in our life when we seek first the kingdom and His righteousness. We're seeking to please the King every day. But we got to get rid of this mindset that it doesn't matter how we live. That is simply not what the Scripture teaches. No, you can't be righteous just by being good. Nobody can be good enough. It's by faith in the blood of Jesus. But when you truly believe, it changes the way you live. That's the truth of Scripture. We're going to go to James chapter 2, verses 19 through 26. And James says, You believe that there's one God, you do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. But do you want to know, O foolish man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? Do you see that faith was working together with his works? And by works faith was made perfect, and the Scripture was fulfilled which says Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. You see then that a man is justified by works, not by faith only. Likewise, was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out another way? For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. There are some people that are so opposed to the truth of this passage, they just want to take it out of their Bible. They just want to ignore it. They just want to stick with the one truth that Paul taught in uh, Romans chapter 3 and exclude everything else from the Scripture. And I'll declare to you the same thing I've told you many times before. The Bible all fits together, and it all works together. And until you can put the pieces of it together, you don't have the whole truth. 
And this, this idea that it doesn't matter how we live, you see, that's just simply not in the Scripture. Because when we truly believe, our life will be evidence of it. Amen. There is change in our life. See, it, th- that kind of faith, the Bible says, can't save. It's when we, we act on it. It's when there's evidence in our life, when we truly believe. We need a hunger, a thirst for righteousness to get right with God, but also to live for God. I'm saying that because there's this danger that we no longer desire to truly be close to Him. And we take for granted His forgiveness and the grace that affords us such a Wonderful relationship to be close to God. We need to tear down those old strongholds of deception that it doesn't matter. Just three chapters later, after Romans chapter 3 and Romans chapter 6, the Apostle Paul talks about righteousness again. And this is just as true as what we read in Romans chapter 3. Beginning in verse 15, he says, What then? Shall we sin because we're not under law, but under grace? Certainly not. Let me put that in modern vernacular. Certainly not. That just sounds a little too nice. Here's what he was saying. No way! No way! Shall we just continue in sin? No way! Shall we just accept a little sin in our life? No way! Is it just no big deal because, you know, we're saved by by faith? Praise the Lord. No way! We're not going to allow sin in our life. No way, he says. Do you not know that to whom you present yourself slaves to obey, you are that one slaves whom you obey? Whether sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness. Obedience leading to righteousness. You see, nobody can be righteous by the works of the law, but we are supposed to be obedient. We are supposed to have that obedience in our life leading to righteousness. Verse 17, But God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. And having been set free from sin, you have become the slaves of righteousness. A slave of righteousness, yes, that you don't want to do anything that would displease the Lord. You don't want to do anything that the Scripture says not to do. That You you don't want to leave anything undone that the Scripture tells you to do. Because you're a slave to righteousness. That's what the Bible says about righteousness. You see, we can't get complacent and get to the place where we think we don't need to change anymore. No, we hunger and we thirst for this righteousness. You know, it's not about being perfect. We all know that none of us is perfect. None of us has arrived. But it is about the desire to change. It is about not being content with where we are, but we're always wanting to grow and to learn and to be like Him. Romans 8, 29 says that we've been predestined to be conformed into the image of God's Son. You see, we can't be content with where we are. No, we're still hungry. We're still thirsty for that righteousness, to be close to Him and to be like Him. In 2 Corinthians 5.21, it says, He made Him, Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. The one who knew no sin took all of our sins upon Him. He knew no sin, but He took every sin, past, present, future. He took all of the shame, all of the guilt, the condemnation. He bore it all. I'm so thankful. I don't want to add one more sin. But it says that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. 
I want you to understand this morning that when he says that we might become the righteousness of God in him, yes, it is freely given to us because of what the Lord Jesus did. He took our sins. But you also need to understand that he's not just calling us righteous. He is saying that we might become, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Let me just illustrate it to you this way. You see, if I had a, a bottle of muddy water and I said, hey, would you like to have a drink? You would say, um, no. Right? Now, what if I get me a label and I put on there and it says clean water? How about now? No. And this is exactly the attitude that a lot of Christians have about being righteous. Filthy, dirty, sins in their life, all kinds of compromise, not living right, and they know it, and yet they're saying, oh, but God says I'm righteous. No, that's not how it works. He's made you to be righteous. You are not the same old person. You are a new creation in Christ. Old things are passed away. All things are become new. Church, we, this is the truth of the Word. We're partakers of His divine nature. No, we haven't arrived, but we are hungry and we're thirsty. We want to clean it up. We're not going to compromise and allow sins in our life when our Savior paid such a price for us. We're a new creation, got a new nature. And I'll tell you, this is the power of the gospel in the New Testament. Ephesians 4, 21 through 24, Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he writes, If indeed you have heard Him and have been taught by Him as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning your former conduct the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lust. See, we got to get rid of all that old life. See, Jesus isn't a way for you to just keep living the same old life but go to heaven. No, you put off that old life. You don't want any part of that anymore. He says, be renewed in the spirit of your mind. So you need to change the way you're thinking. And then he says this, and that you put on the new man, which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. That new nature was created in true righteousness and holiness. And we put off that old life and we put on this new nature. We choose to do it. You put on that new nature, true righteousness and holiness. Listen, these are things that, that the, the world considers to be, you know, it's like, taboo. We don't talk about being righteous. We don't talk about being holy. In fact, it's almost become taboo to talk about holiness in the church today. We are God's holy people. God says in Peter, be holy in all your conduct. And so I've heard, I'm hearing people nowadays, they're saying, oh, God, just, God calls us righteous. He, he calls us holy. No, He makes us holy. We're supposed to be holy in all our conduct. We're supposed to be different from this world. Not just different because we go to church and we don't sin the way they do. No, but we, we sincerely are putting off that old life and putting on the new man created in righteousness and holiness. Titus 2, 11 and 12. For the grace of God that brings salvation, amen, has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age. I want you to notice this is how it's supposed to be for those that have been saved. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, worldly desires, we should live soberly, righteously. How are you supposed to live? Righteously. 
and godly in this present age. I tell you, the Word of God has so much to say about how we're supposed to live. We are supposed to be different from this old world around us. I just want you to hear me. This is for all of us. Paul writes to young Pastor Timothy, 1 Timothy 6.11. He says, But you, O man of God, flee these things and pursue righteousness. See, if we're hungry and thirsty for righteousness, it's something that we are going after. We're pursuing. We're not complacent about it. We're not content. No, it's something that we want in our life, and we're going after it. We're pursuing it. Hungry and thirsty. We all still sin. We all still mess up. But are we hungry and thirsty for righteousness? You see, here it is. Do we want to change? Do we want to grow? Do we want to be free? Do we want to live for Him and glorify Him each and every day of our life? Do we want a lost and dying world to see our lives as a witness and a testimony to a God who can change their life? We're going to go to 1 John chapter 1 and begin with verse 8. It says, If we say that we have no sin... We deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. We'll never forget the man that told me he didn't sin. We all sin. None of us is perfect. We know that. Verse 9, he says, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And again, he says, if we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Oh, we've all sinned. But here's the thing. You see, when we mess up, when we sin, we confess it to him and he will not only forgive us. There's a second part to this. Yes, he forgives. He also cleanses us from unrighteousness. When the Holy Spirit brings something to your mind, when you see it in the Word, you hear it preached, and you know that something's not right, you haven't forgiven that person yet, or maybe you've been gossiping about somebody, or maybe you had not been obeying God in your giving, whatever it is, you know that the Holy Spirit has put His finger on it. It is time for you to confess it. It is time for you to make it right with God and He'll forgive you and cleanse you. It is not automatic. It's when you confess it to Him. You see, this deceptive doctrine that none of it matters. And I've even heard people say, you don't have to confess it. It's all automatic. I want to tell you, when the Holy Spirit is dealing with your heart and you resist it, your heart becomes hard and you no longer hear His voice. There's a lot of people living right there. They don't hunger and thirst for righteousness anymore. They're perfectly content where they are and they're not really living for God. They're not pleasing God. Oh, the Scripture... I didn't write this stuff. I just want to remind you of that. I just John 2, verse 1, My little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And He Himself is the propitiation, the payment for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. Thank God. You see, we have an advocate with the Father. Jesus has paid the price for our sins. We don't take that for granted. We don't take that as a light thing. But it's an awesome thing that our Father forgives us and He cleanses us because of what Jesus has done for us. Verse 3, now by this we know that we know Him if we keep His commandments. There's a whole lot of people saying they know the Lord, 
but they don't keep His commandments, they're lying. Four of you. I got four of you. I actually believe this stuff, even if it doesn't sound like the gospel of the day. This is the truth of God's Word. I'm going to preach it. I'm going to try my best to live it. I'm hungry and thirsty for righteousness. Listen. He says, He who says, I know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar. And the truth is not in him. He who says, I know him and doesn't keep his commandments is a liar. That doesn't mean you got to be perfect. It means that if you're not sincere and seeking and hungering, thirsting for that righteousness, you see, if you're allowing things to just stay in your life like it's no big deal, do you really know him? But whoever keeps His Word, truly the love of God is perfected in Him. By this we know that we are in Him. He who says He abides in Him ought Himself also to walk just as He walked. See, this is what we hunger for. This is what we're thirsty for. To walk just as He walked. To be like Him. I don't know about you, but I feel like I got so far to go. Some of you are thinking, yeah, you got a long ways to go, Pastor. I know it. I know it. I wouldn't argue with you. But here's the thing I'm hungry for it, I'm thirsty for it. More than ever, I want to be like him. I want to learn to walk as he walked. I'm going to drop down to verse 28 and 29 of chapter 2 there. And now, little children, abide in Him, that when He appears we may have confidence and not be ashamed before Him at His coming. And if you know Him or know that He is righteous, you know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of Him. Everyone who practices righteousness is born of Him. Let's go to chapter 3, verse 7 through 10. I know y'all are looking at the screen, right? Amen. Either turn or get there, but I want you to see it because I want you to know this is not me. This is not my idea. I didn't come up with this stuff. This stuff is in the Bible, and the fact that nobody preaches it just means it needs to be preached all the more. Listen, there's so much truth being left out of the pop theology of the day, and I want to tell you it doesn't please God, and it doesn't bring freedom and victory. We need the whole truth of the Word of God. He says, little children, let no one deceive you. So many people have been deceived. He who practices righteousness is righteous. Does that fit with our theology? Does that fit with what we believe? This is what the Bible says. He who practices righteousness is righteous. It is phony. It is so phony. It is such a deception to say it doesn't matter how we live. He who sins is of the devil. Wow. For the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifest that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whoever has been born of God does not sin. Now, I want to I explain to you what he's saying here. He doesn't, we just read two chapters earlier in John that we all sin. What he's talking about here is habitual sin. It's continuing in sin. You know that there's certain things that are wrong and you just go on in it anyway. There's a whole lot of that going on in our world right now where they know stuff is wrong, they know it's not supposed and they do it anyway. All in the name of grace. You know, the book of Jude talks about that, that there will be those who change the grace of our God into a license for immorality. He says... For His seed, God's seed, remains in us and we cannot continue on. We can't stay in that sin because He's been born of God. 
In this, the children of God and the children of the devil are manifest. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is he who does not love his brother. Wow. You see, when we live righteously, it is proof that God has done something in our life. No, none of us is perfect. We all make mistakes, but we want to change. We want to, we're hungry, we're thirsting to be closer to Him and to, to be more like Him each and every day and to live in a way that brings glory and honor to Him. Hunger and thirst for righteousness. We can't just accept sin in our life. I'm a little bit neurotic about certain things, and one of those is the appearance of this building. I mean, we not, might not be a rich church, but I just think we ought to do the best we can with what we have. And so I like everything to be neat and straight and clean and just right. It drives me crazy when it's not. You know, uh, this morning... I walked into a room and there's some granite there that I had caulked several months ago and I, I left a little extra caulk on there so I'd come back later with a razor blade and clean it off and I kept forgetting about it and I walked in there this morning and like this was important, I had to go get the razor blade and do it right then. And the reason I'm this way is because this is the Lord's house. This is where His people gather to worship. This is a special place. And it's important. You know, how would you feel if you came in and the chairs were all out of whack and just every which way? Or there was paper all over the floor, communion cups in the seats that hadn't been picked up? See, we go out in the parking lot and chewing gum on the concrete. We ain't letting that happen. We're cleaning it up. I've been to businesses before where they got those ugly stains all over their parking lot, even on their entrance. It looks awful. We ain't having that. We're keeping it clean. We, we are the temple of God. How much more should we not allow things in our life that don't belong there? That we clean it up. That we're the temple of the Holy Spirit. He says, don't you know you are the temple of the Holy Spirit? I can't just look the other way. I want to tell you something. You see, when it comes to taking care of this building, we just start accepting a little here and a little there. and it doesn't matter. It's no big deal. And before long, the whole place just looks like a wreck. And you know what? The same thing is true in our life. We start accepting just a little here and a little there. And before long, we're allowing other things and more things and more things. We get to the place we're not really living for God at all. We need to hunger and thirst for righteousness that we will not allow ourselves to continue on in some of those same old habits and ways. Not content, but hungry. And here's the thing. When we start justifying and rationalizing our sin by what others do, how's that work? It goes like this. Well, everybody sins. Everybody sins. Pastor Mark. Pastor Mark sins. Everybody sins. What ends up happening is that people start living and doing things that they know aren't right by that rationalization and that justification. Everybody sins. And we end up with the, the attitude in the body of Christ today where people are living together without being married. They know it's wrong, but they do it anyway. 
People gossip and talk about others. They know it's wrong, but they do it anyway. And I want to tell you something. Even, even to the extreme where somebody has, is living as with bondage in their, in their life, as some sin, like being bound by drugs or alcohol. Hear me now. I'm not preaching condemnation on you. In fact, I'm telling you, God will forgive you and He wants to help you. He wants you to be free. But you can't stay there. You got to make up your mind. You're hungry, that you're thirsty for righteousness. You want to be free from all of that. And you can't allow it to go on in your life anymore. So when we're hungry and thirsty, we're willing to forsake it. We're willing to go to God and ask for forgiveness and cleansing. When we're hungry and thirsty, we keep on growing in the Lord, desiring to be more like Him. When we're hungry and thirsty, we keep reading the Scripture. Did you know the Word of God is also called the Word of Righteousness? That's New Testament. It's the Word of Righteousness. If, we, if we're really hungry, we keep going to the Word of God. Jesus said, man doesn't live by bread alone, but by every Word of God. See, we ought to always be hungry for the Word, because it's the Word, not only that will show you what's right and what's wrong, but it's also the Word that will help you to have the power to overcome and to get victory in your life. It'll help you to believe the promises of God. See, if we're really hungry and thirsty, then we're going to seek Him with all our heart. We're going to make time for prayer. We're going to make time for those opportunities to go to worship and really seek the Lord. I'm just telling you, we got to stay hungry. Amen. None of us has already attained or been made perfect. But we're hungry. We're thirsty. And more than anything, we want to be like Him. In Psalm 17 and 15, the psalmist says, As for me, I will see your face in righteousness. I shall be satisfied when I awake in your likeness. I'm telling you that when we truly hunger and thirst for righteousness... God pours so many blessings into our life. Such victory, such peace, such joy. Most of all, that we become more like Him. I want you to stand with me. We're going to pray. I'd like for our prayer partners to go ahead and come.